Hey there, nerds. So, I live next to Lake Michigan, where it's always colder by the lake in the summer and warmer by the lake in the winter. As I'm writing this, the U.S. is going through a brutal cold spell. When I hopped in my car this morning, the temperature was about negative one degrees Fahrenheit, but it still managed to drop to negative six when I got about 30 minutes away from the lake. As of writing this, it's the middle of January, and it got me thinking, when will the temperature of Lake Michigan actually flip? Stay tuned, because we're going to be talking about ocean currents, the climates of ocean towns, and how they differ from large inland lakes and the cities near them. You'll be amazed to find out that massive lakes like the Great Lakes, Lake Victoria, and Lake Baikal don't operate in the way that oceans do. So let's just jump right into it. Large inland lakes, like Lake Michigan and its fellow Great Lakes, are fascinating because they act like mini oceans in some ways, but have their own quirks that make them unique. So first, let's talk about why it's cooler by the lake in the summer and warmer by the lake in the winter. Large bodies of water have something called a high specific heat capacity. This means that water heats up and cools down much more slowly than land. And just as a fun caveat, this is the reason that there are more ice caps in the northern hemisphere, because there's more land. So in the summer, the lake is still shedding the coolness it held onto from the winter, acting like a giant air conditioner for the surrounding area. By wintertime, the lake is slow to release all of that summer heat, turning into a massive radiator that keeps the lakefront cozier, while areas further inland will freeze solid. It's basically like a nice little thermostat. But when does the lake itself flip? Well, this gets into the phenomenon of lake turnover, which is a crucial part of the story for any large lake. In the summer, the surface of the lake warms up. And because warm water is less dense, it floats on top of the colder, denser water below. The lake essentially separates into two layers, the warm epilimnion on top and the cold hypolimnion below, with a boundary called the thermocline in between them. These layers stay pretty stable until the fall comes around. When the air temperatures drop in the fall, the surface water cools and it eventually becomes dense enough to sink. This triggers the lake itself to mix and it redistributes all the oxygen and nutrients throughout the water column, and this is a process known as fall turnover. The same thing happens in spring after winter ice melts and the water equalizes to a uniform temperature of about 4 degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature where water is at its densest. So that's when spring turnover happens. So this flipping happens twice a year, in the spring and the fall. So what about in the dead of winter like right now? Well, Lake Michigan's surface water is hovering near freezing, while the deeper layers remain a balmy 39 degrees Fahrenheit by comparison. So since the ice floats, any freezing happens at the surface, but the deeper water stays liquid, ensuring that fish and other critters can survive the winter. And just as a fun add-on, because the Great Lakes are so big, they rarely freeze over entirely. Even during the harsh winter of 2014, when it felt like the entire Midwest turned into Enceladus, Lake Michigan's ice cover maxed out at about 93%. So while we're dealing with brutal wind chills, the lake is still holding on to a bit of warmth deep down. Now, compare this to oceans, which don't really turn over the way that lakes do. Oceans are driven by massive thermohaline currents, which is kind of a global conveyor belt powered by the differences in water temperature and salinity. The most famous of which I'm sure you've probably heard of is called the AMOC, or the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Current. Coastal ocean towns often feel temperature moderation on steroids because of these currents. So think of San Francisco where the cold California current keeps the summers cool, or the balmy Gulf Stream that keeps places like Western Europe warmer than you'd expect for their latitude. You draw a line directly west from Italy, and you'll actually end up in New York or Boston, where it's far colder, and this is all because of the AMOC. Inland lakes like Michigan don't have the salinity to factor in, so they play by simpler rules. And then there's Lake Victoria, Lake Baikal, and other world-famous inland lakes. Lake Victoria, it's in tropical Africa, so it doesn't get the dramatic temperature swings of the Great Lakes because it's near to the equator, so the seasonal changes are more muted. And kind of on the flip end, you have Lake Baikal in Siberia, which is so deep that it holds on to the cold water year-round, making it one of the coldest lakes on the planet, even in the summer. So you really don't want to swim in there without a wetsuit. But What's the bottom line? So if you live near a massive lake like Michigan, it's both a blessing and a curse. You get more stable temperatures year round, perfect for avoiding the extremes, but you also get those lake effect snowstorms where the lake's warmth powers up snow clouds and dumps piles of fluffy misery all over your driveway. 
So there's a trade-off, but it's better than living next to an actual ocean where you have hurricanes, right? I don't know, it's certainly cheaper. So stick around because next we're gonna break down lake effect snow and how these giant lakes act like snow factories. Spoiler alert, if you thought the lake was done influencing your winter, think again. We're also going to get into how Europe's massive seas like the Baltic and Caspian's heat exchanges work and much, much more. So if you've made it this far, leave a comment, tell me how I'm doing, make sure to leave a like and check out one of these related videos. All right, see you later, nerds. I hope everyone learned something amazing today.